Let's talk about the solution to the support vector machine optimization problem. Now, as I mentioned, there are two ways to solve it. Um, one way is to use a generic QP solver, and another is to use a specialized solver like SMO, and I'll talk about SMO in another video. But in any case, um, let's assume that you've solved this problem and that you have the, um, that you have the, the alpha stars. And now you're going to try and use those alpha stars to recover the optimal primal variables, the lambdas. So how do we do that? Well, um, we're going to use the, one of the KKT conditions. And in particular, uh, this one comes from Lagrangian stationarity. And so I've just I put it in the thought bubble because I was I'm remembering uh, from the last video what that condition was. OK, so as it turns out, if you know what the alpha stars are, you can just put them into this KKT condition to get the lambda stars. OK, so you just pop them right in and, and there you go. You, you have now um, you have now the optimal lambdas. And now we also need to find the optimal uh, values for the intercept terms. But before we do that, there's something cool I want to show you. OK, so let's take a look at the complementary slackness condition. This condition has some really cool implications. OK, so um, there are two terms here, right? There are two terms, and they, they, their product is equal to 0. So if one of them is non-zero, well, there are only a few possibilities, OK? So let's say that alpha star is non-zero. Let's say alpha star is positive, strictly positive. So in that case, the other term has to be 0, which means that, um, you know, that y times that thing equals 1. OK, cool. So another possibility is that the alphas are strictly less than 0. But that's not a possibility. Because as we know, the alphas are always greater than or equal to zero. So can't happen. Next, um, well, let's say that that term in the brackets is less than zero. So in that case, if that's true. The alpha better be equal to zero from complementary slackness. And then the last possibility is that this term in brackets is strictly greater than zero. But that can't happen because that would be saying that there's a margin that is an, that one of the optimal margins is below one. And we set the whole problem up so that all the margins would be at least one. And so that would violate the whole way the problem was set up in the primal. So that can't happen. All right, so um, I just want to point out that that thing here is the optimal value, is the, the optimal um, value of uh, f, it's, it's f star of xi, where f star is like the, the solution that comes from lambda star and lambda zero star. Okay. So if you think about that, then you realize we have actually margins all over this problem. Okay. So in other words, that very first line there says that if alpha star is strictly greater than zero, then the margin at the optimal solution the unnormalized margin is equal to one. It's exactly equal to one. And then the alternative is that um, the margin is strictly greater than one. The unnormalized margin is strictly greater than one, in which case alpha has to equal zero. OK, so we have only these two cases. There's no other cases, right? So either alpha is strictly greater than zero, and in which case the unnormalized margins are 1, or the margins are greater than 1, in which case alpha is 0. Now, the first case, these are actually called, these the, the data points where this actually holds, those are called support vectors. That's where the name comes from. That's where the whole tech, that's the whole idea of the technique. It comes from this, the name of this thing. OK, and then if the margin is greater than 1, that means these points are far away from the decision boundary, and they don't matter. OK, so yeah, support. This is where the name comes from. I think, I think to be honest, that the coolness of that name is why I went into the whole field of machine learning. OK, so we have these points. We've run, uh, we've created the dual. We ran it through um, the QP solver, or SMO, and got our optimal alphas. We took the alphas. We got the optimal lambdas. And then, um, as it turns out, are points that are the closest to the decision boundary. They have a normalized margin of 1. These are the support vectors. 
And these are the only points for which alpha is strictly greater than zero. For all the other points, alpha has to equal zero. Okay, so these are the only points for which that those con those particular constraints are are binding, right? That those are the constraints where where the, the that um, um, that unnormalized margin is one. Okay, so fine. Before I got excited about support vectors and the whole and the name of them and all that other stuff, uh, we were trying to figure out what lambda zero star was. So the way we're going to figure that out is we're going to grab a positive support vector. So grab a data point with y equals one that has a margin of one. Okay, and we know there will be one that exists because if if one didn't exist, that means we don't have the optimal solution, right? That means we can make the, the, the solution better, right? We can make the norm flatter until we actually hit that, hit, hit it so that one of them has a uh, margin of one. Okay, so pick this point. Y1, y, yi equals one, because it was a positive data point. And then I can solve for lambda zero star just from there. So all I have to do is pick a support vector and I get lambda zero star for free. Cool. So just to summarize, um, to solve the support vector machine optimization problem, we would solve the dual problem, get the alpha stars, use them to get the primal lambda star, grab a support vector and get, a lambda, and get lambda zero star. And then once we have lambda star and lambda zero star, we can make predictions using those because those are what define f of x, which are which is our prediction function. Okay, so yeah, we can make a prediction using f star, which is defined this way. Now, I want to point out a couple of important things. First, um, because of the form of this solution, it's possible that lambda star becomes very fast to calculate. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, this sum only needs alpha i's that are um, that are non-zero, right? You you can you can get rid of all of the terms there, all of the data points i, for which alpha i is zero because they don't factor into anything. So what are the points where the alphas are non-zero? Those are the support vectors. So this whole sum, right? That whole sum only needs to be taken over support vectors. So if you have say a huge data set, but only a small fraction of the points are support vectors then the solution only depends on those points, and so you can calculate it more quickly. Now, I will warn you that it very often is the case that if you have a huge data set, you still have a lot of support vectors. But I should mention that it's possible that um, if your data set is structured like this, then you might be able to, um, to get away with much less computation. So the support vectors actually determine everything. The support vectors determine lambda star and lambda zero star, none of the other data points factor into the definition of the final classifier, right? And so what that means is that I can take a data point that is not a support vector and I can move it wherever I want as long as I don't, as long as I don't go through, um, you know, that whole area near the decision boundary. I can move it wherever I want kind of off there in outer space and it won't affect the solution. And I can move all of these positive points as long as I keep them on the positive side, I can move them anywhere I want without affecting the solution. And same with the negatives. Like, as long as they're not support vectors, I can move them wherever I like, as long as I don't interfere with the, with the margin, the whole area where the margin is one or less than one. All right, thanks. <laughs>